Section 5 of Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 5. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Helen. Library of the World's Best Mystery and Detective Stories, Volume 5, by Julian Hawthorne, Editor. Section 5. Andrea Dauphin by Paul Hayes, Part 2. The following day, the newcomer arose early. He paused on the stair where his landlady sat at her accustomed place, just long enough to inquire the way to the offices of several notaries whose names had been given him by a friend in pressure. The widow looked at her guest in curiosity. He seemed so blind to everything about him, even to the young ability of her Marietta. But in spite of his grey hair and the illness of which he had spoken, his step was quick and firm, his chest was deep and the colour of his face was clear and youthful. Many a woman looked after him as he passed through the streets, although he did not seem to notice them in return. Although Andrea had been so careful in asking directions from Madame Giovanna, when once out of his old street, he threaded the net of alleys and canals as if quite at home there, Several hours passed in a vain search for work. In spite of the recommendation he had brought from pressure, and in spite of the modesty of his manner, there was a certain look of pride in his carriage which seemed to say that he considered the work he sought beneath his dignity. Finally, he found a position with a very low salary in the office of a little notary in the side street. The haste with which he consented to take the position made the owner of the office think that his new clerk was probably one of the many impoverished noblemen now trying to earn a livelihood by raw labour. Andrew seems quite satisfied with the result of his morning's work and entered the nearest inn, a haunt of poorer classes, to take his dinner. He sat in a corner near the door and ate the simple food without complaint although he did not seem to care for the wine after he had tasted it. He was about to pay for his food when his neighbour, whom he had not noticed hitherto, spoke to him. This was a man of about thirty years old, with curly blonde hair, wearing the usual Venetian costume of quiet black, a gap which did not once betray his jewels decent. He wore heavy golden rings in his ears and jewelled buckles on his shoes while his linen was far from clean and his clothes was unbrushed. You do not seem to like the wine, sir, he said in a low tone, turning to Andrew. You have probably come here by mistake. They are not accustomed to serving guests of rank in this house. I beg your pardon, sir, replied Andrew quietly. What do you know of my rank? I can see by the way you eat that you do not belong to the class of those who come here daily, said the jewel. Andrew looked at him sharply. Then a sudden thought seemed to change his mood and impel him to meet the other with more friendliness. You are a good churchman, he said. I have known better days, although I am the son of a small merchant and have studied law without any great success. But my father became bankrupt, and a poor scribe and lawyer's apprentice has no right to expect anything better than he can find in such a place as this. A scholar has always a right to demand respect, said the other with a polite smile. I should be very glad to be of service to you if I could. I have always desired the company of gentlemen of learning. Might I suggest that you drink a glass of better wine with me? I cannot afford better wine, said the other indifferently. I would look upon it as an honour to be allowed to show you our Venetian hospitality. Andrew was about to put an end to the conversation when he noticed the landlord beckoning to him from the back of the room. He noticed also that the other guests seemed much interested in his conversation with the jewel. With the excuse that he must first pay his account, he left his chair and walked to the table where sat the landlord. The old man whispered to him, Oh, sir, be careful. That is a dangerous man. The inquisitors paid him for prying out the secrets of all strangers who come here. I have to endure his presence to avoid trouble, but I can at least warn you. Andrew thanked him, returned to his place, and said to the officious neighbour, I will go with you, sir, if you desire. Then, in a lower tone, I can see that they take you for a spy here. 
Let us continue our conversation elsewhere. The Jew's face paled. By God, he said, they wrong me. My business leads me in and out to many houses. But what do I care for the secrets that may be hidden there? However, I cannot blame these people for their watchfulness. The bloodhounds of the Signoria are in every street. But in your opinion, sir, what is your name? Samuel. In your opinion, said Samuel, you think too hardly of those who are working for the good of the state, in that they discover all conspiracies against the Republic and frustrate them before they become dangerous. The Jew stood still and caught the view of his arm. Why did I not recognize you at once? Since when you are in the service? I? Since day after tomorrow. Are you mocking me, sir? Most assuredly not. It is my serious intention to take service in those ranks. I am very poor, as I told you, and the employment I have been able to obtain is miserably paid. I wish to better my condition. Your confidence honors me, said the Jew thoughtfully. But the gentlemen do not like to take strangers into their service until they have gone through with a trial apprenticeship. If my purse can be of any service to you during this time, I ask but for a low rate of interest for my friends. I am grateful to you, but your protection and your recommendation are of great service to me. This is my house, and I must leave you now, for I have much work to do. When I am needed, remember me. Andrew Delphin, Cala de la Cortesia. Andrew could not mount the stairs to reach his room without passing his little landlady, who, of course, was most anxious to know what he had done. She was far more discontented than he seemed to be at the position he had found, and she was much worried that he would not return to the streets, bright with sunshine, and enjoy the concert in the neighboring square. Even little Marietta, when she had brought him a supper he asked for late in the day, was too much abashed by the gravity of his expression to chat her as was her wont. Oh, mother, she exclaimed, as she returned to the staircase, I don't want to go into his room again. He has eyes like the martyr in the picture in the chapel. I can't laugh when he looks at me like that. But little Marietta would have been very much surprised if she could have seen the guest several hours later. Under cover of the night, he stood at his window in lively conversation with the maid opposite. Fez Merendina, he said, I could scarce await the hour when I should see you again. As I passed the goldsmith's shop, I thought of you and bought you this brooch. It is not fine enough for you, but at least it is more real than the clasp on your turban. Open the window and I will throw it over, in the hope of going the same way myself soon. You are very gallant, smiled the girl, catching the little package. And what good taste you have! I am glad of anything to make me rejoice today. It has been a hard day for us, for the countess is in very evil humour. Her lover, the son of Senator Gritty, has not been here for four and twenty hours. She is sent to his house, but he is missing from there also, and it is feared that he has been imprisoned. The countess will see no one. She lies on her sofa, whipping, and struck at me when I would comfort her. Does no one know of what the young man is accused? I would be willing to take a vow of internal chastity, sir. If that poor boy is found ever to have conspired against the state, he was only three and twenty, and he thought of nothing but the countess, or perhaps his game of cards. But the gentlemen of the Inquisition can make a hangman's rug out of a cobweb. Speak more cautiously when you mention the authorities, said Andrea gently. The wisdom of our fathers gave him the power. It is not for us to doubt it. The girl looked at him to see whether he was in earnest, but it was not easy to read his features. Be not so grave, I pray you, she said. I find it very stupid. You have been here but for a short time. Therefore you still have some respect for these hangmen, who may perhaps look quite reverend from a distance. But I've seen them here at the card table, and I can assure you that they're just like the rest of us. That may be, my child, he answered. But they have the power, and it is not wise for a poor citizen like myself to utter such speeches at an open window. 
You may say what you like here, said the maid. There are a few windows looking out on the canal, and the rooms are empty at this hour. On your side there is nothing but a blank wall. But will you not come over for an hour and drink a glass of wine with me? I have a boat here which will make a bridge between our two windows. Are you easily dizzy? No, indeed, fair friend. Patience for a moment and then I am ready to come to you. Andrew put out the light, bolted the door of his room, listened for a moment, and then went to the window. Smerendina had her improvised bridge ready and stood beckoning to him. He sprang up onto the window sill, looked down at the black water below for the calm eye, and with a single step had crossed the space. She caught him in her arms as he sprang down on the other side, and her lips touched his cheek. But he assumed a modest demeanor, as if awed by the respect to his friend in her own home. The girl drew in the blank, brought cards and wine from a cupboard, and the two sat down to a lively chatter. Smerandina had just poured herself a second glass of wine, and was gently scolding her guests for not drinking more when a bell shrilled out from somewhere in the house. The girl threw down her cards angrily and rose from her chair. See how annoying it is? I haven't an hour to myself. But be patient for a few moments. I will return as quick as I can. Left alone, Andrew went to the window and looked carefully at the space of wall between his old window and the canal. It was not more than twenty feet in height, and a plaster had become loosened in so many places that the naked stones afforded sufficient foothold for a good clamour. The little door of a palace was immediately under the window at which he stood, and between the boat lying chained there and the wall opposite there was only just room for a second gondola to pass. I could not have arranged it better myself, he murmured, as I looked down thoughtfully at the dark waters flowing between the blank walls. In the distance, a pale light appeared, moving nearer, and in a little while, the noise of oars floated up to him. A gondola came slowly down the stream and haunted at the door below. The listener at the window drew back, but he could see a man step from the boat and he heard three heavy blows of knocker beneath. From within the house, a voice asked who it was that demanded entrance. Open, in the name of the mighty council of the ten, was the answer. The door was opened and closed again behind the nightly visitor. A few moments later, Smerandina hurried back into her room in great excitement. Did you hear it? She has whispered. Oh, they have come to take our countess away. They will kill her, and who will pay me the six months' wages that she owes me? Be calm, dear child, he answered. You will find good friends who will not forsake you, but I will be very grateful to you. You could hide me somewhere where I might see what the mighty council has decided to your mistress. I am a stranger here, and it would interest me greatly. The girl thought a moment, then she said, I could do it easily. The hiding place is a good one. But suppose it should be discovered. I will take it all upon myself, my dear, and no one shall know who let me into the house. Here is the money, in case I may not be able to show my gratitude to you later. But if all goes well, you shall see that I am willing to divide the little I have with such a kind friend. She slipped the money into a pocket, opened the door, and looked out into the blackness of the corridor. Take off your shoes she whispered and give me your hand and follow wherever i may lead you every one in the house is asleep except the doorkeeper she extinguished her lamp and slipped through the corridor drawing him after her they passed through several dark rooms then entered a large dancing hall dimly lighted by a pale glimmer falling through the three high windows on one side the staircase led up to a balcony for the musicians have a care wanted to go. The steps creak. I will leave you alone now. You will find a crack in the wall up there, through which you can look down into the countess' reception room. But do not move from your place until I come for you. She left him alone, and he mounted the few steps and felt along the wall until he came to the crack. The neighboring room was separated from a great hall by a wooden partition only, as in early days the two had been one. 
Andrew knelt down and put his eye to the crack in the wall, through which a ray of light fell. Uncomfortable as his position was, there were many who would have been glad to change with him. A large silver candelabrum stood on the table, beside the divan upon which the countess lay. She was clad in a loose gown, which showed that she had not expected visitors at this hour. Her rich red blonde hair was caught up carelessly, her eyes, over reddened with whipping, still shone brilliantly. The man who sat opposite her in an armchair, turning his back to Andre, seemed to be watching her sharply. He sat motionless, listening quietly to the angry words of the beauty woman. I am astonished, said the countess in a bitter tone. I am astonished that you dare to show yourself here, now that you have so shamefully broken all your solemn promises to me. Is it for this that I have done you so many services? What have you done with him, with my poor friend, the only one I cared for, and whom you promised to spare, no matter what happened? Was there no offer that you could find if your prisons are empty? Give him back to me, or I will break off all relations with you. I will leave Venice and follow my love in his exile. You will soon see what you have lost by this betrayal. You forget, Countess, said the man, that we have means to prevent your flight. Or to find you where you might go. Young Gritty deserves his punishment. In spite of our warnings, he continued to be seen everywhere with the secretary of the Austrian ambassador, a young man who knows much too much. It was a sigh of our paternal kindness toward him that we exiled him before he came more guilty. But we know what we owe you, Leonora, and therefore I have been sent to you to tell you of this, and to show you how all can be made good again if you will only be sensible. I am tired of taking orders from you, she said hastily. I see now that it is impossible to have faith in you. I see now that it is useless to expect any return from you for all I have done. I want no more of you. I need you no longer. I am only sorry, he interrupted, that we still need you. You will understand, Leonora, that it would not be possible for us to allow you, who knows so many secrets of the Republic, to travel in foreign parts. You might fall a victim to the disease of the times, the desire to write memoirs. Venice and you are still inseparable, and you should by this time understand that it will not take us long to reconcile you. I want no reconciliation, she cried passionately, with tears in her eyes. What would it mean to me? I want nothing. I know nothing but the one thought that I have lost my poor critty. You sure I have him back, Leonora, but not at once, for its sudden return would interfere with our plans. And how long must I wait? she asked. That depends upon you, he answered. How much time do you need to bring a young man to your feet? One who has a reputation for virtue. A gleam of interest brightened the despair of her face. Of whom are you speaking? she asked. I mean the young German who was Gritter's friend, the secretary of the Venice minister. You know him? I saw him at the last regatta. We have reason to believe that he is in communication with our opponents, and that he is utilizing the discontent left by the Quirinese banishment for the good of his old sovereign. But he is very clever, and we can obtain no proofs. For this, we turn to you, Leonora. We want you to give us the key to the secrets of this well-guarded mind. We could hope for nothing from you as long as Critty was here. His exile leaves you free, and gives you an excuse for a nearer acquaintance with his friend. The rest I leave to the power of your charms, which are never greater than where they meet resistance. She lay silent for a few moments, her eyes brightening, her beautiful mouth curving to a smile. Then you promise to call Crypto back at once, when I have handed the offer over to you. We promise. You will not have to wait long then. She stood up and paced the room. Andrew could see her when she passed within the area commanded by the crack at which he sat. Her large dark eyes, glancing upward, rested on his hiding place. He started involuntarily as if discovered. The man in the armchair stood up also, but seemed to be blind to her beauty, 
for he continued to talk in a business-like tone. And one more thing, Leonora, the sum which we still owe you for the supper you gave Candiano. She stirred violently and changed color. By all the saints, she exclaimed, do not mention that again. Give the rest of the money to the church that it may read masses for its soul and for mine. Whenever I hear that name, it sounds in my ears like the trumpets of a judgment day. You are a child, said the other. The responsibility for that supper falls on us, not on you. Young Cadiano was guilty of treason, but his connections and his high rank compelled us to punish him in secret. He died quietly in his bed, and no one could have imagined that he drank death here in your house. Or have you heard any rumours? She trembled and looked down. No, she said. But in the night, I awake with a start, and some voice seems to call to me. You should not have done that. Not that. It is your nerves, Leonora. You must conquer them. There is no one left who has the right to inquire into his death. His elder brother and his sister perished, as you know, by the burning of their home. The money is waiting for you whenever you wish to send for it. Good night, Countess. I will not keep you awake any longer. Rest well that the sun of your beauty may shine careless over the chest and the unjust. Good night, Leonora. He bowed to her lightly and walked toward the door. For a flitting moment, Andrew could see his cold features. It was a face without a soul and without passion, illumined only by the expression of a mighty will. He put on a mask and threw a black cloak over his shoulder, then left the room. A moment later, Andrew heard the girl's voice calling him softly. Like a man who has received a heavy blow, he staggered down from the balcony and followed the maiden without a word. Her room was light again, the wine and cup stood ready on the table. But the man's face was darkened by heavy shadows, so black that it frightened even Serendina's careless nature. You look as if you had seen a ghost, she said. Take a glass of wine and tell me what you have heard. It passed up better than we expected. Oh, yes, he said, with forced calm. The ten are favorably disposed toward your mistress, and you are likely to receive your wages very soon. But they spoke so softly that I hurt little, and I am very tired from kneeling on the hot boards. I will be better able to appreciate your kindness in overtime. Tonight I must sleep. He sprang upon the board which she had laid across the window, and when he reached his old room, he looked down into the canal, at the end of which the light of a disappearing gondola shone dimly. He called a good night over to the opposite window, and then disappeared into the darkness of his room, whilst Mirandina endeavoured in vain to explain to herself the strange contrast in the behaviour of her new friend. A week passed, and yet she had made very little advance in the conquest of her new neighbour. One evening, after having won the favour of the doorkeeper, she let him in at the front door, led him through the house to a little porto over the canal, and entered the gondola with him. He handled the oars himself, rolling slowly through the dark labyrinth of water streets, until they reached the Grand Canal. But in spite of a tete-a-tete with Mirandina, he did not seem to be in a very loving mood and listened callously to her chattering comments on her mistress and the society in which she moved. From them he learned that for the last few days the secretary of the Austrian embassy had spent long hours with the countess. The lady was in a better humour, and showered presents on her handmaiden. Andrew listened so inattentively that the girl did not object when he turned the boat and took the shortest way home. He drove the narrow gondola up to the steps, threw the chain about the post, and asked for the key which locked it. The girl was already in the doorway when her companion called out to her that he had unfortunately dropped a little key into the water. This seemed to annoy her, but with her customary callousness she comforted him with the assurance that there was a second key somewhere in the house. As she let him out of the front door of the palace an hour later, he touched her cheek in a hasty kiss as he said good-bye. The next morning, he explained to his landlady that there was so much work in his new master's office that he had been obliged to spend the night there. 
This was the only time that he had asked for a key of the house. Usually he came home at twilight, ate a light supper, and retired early. His landlady sang his praises to all her neighbors as a motor lodger. On the morning of the second Sunday after Andrew's advent in the widow's house, the little woman entered his room in great excitement. She was dressed in her best clothes, as if just returning from church. But her face was drawn in emotion. He sat at his table reading, his face paler than usual, but his eye calm and quiet. You are sitting here so quietly, sir, she exclaimed. And all Venice in excitement. Holy Jesus, to think that this should happen. And I thought that nothing more could occur here that would surprise me. Of what you are speaking, good woman? he asked in an indifferent tone. She threw herself in a chair, breathless. Would you believe it? Last night, between eleven o'clock and midnight, the noble Lord Lorenzo Venia, the highest of our Greek Grand Inquisitors, was murdered on the doorstep of his old house. Was this an old man? asked Andrea calmly. Mr. Ricordia, you talk as if he had died in his bed. You are no Venetian, and you cannot understand what it means when an inquisitor is murdered. But the most terrible thing about it is that on the dagger which they found in the wood were the words, Death to all inquisitors. That is no private revenge. That is a political murder, so my neighbor says, and it means conspiracy and revolution. Have you any clue to the murderer, Madame Giovanna? Not the faintest, answered the widow. It was a dark, windy night. There was not a gondola to be seen on the Grand Canal, where his palace is. He came home alone through a side street, was struck down, and lived just long enough to arouse the doorkeeper. There was nobody to be seen, but I know what I know. You are a good man, and you will not tell anyone if I say to you that I know the hand that shed this blood. He looked at her firmly. Say what you wish. I will not betray you. She came close to him. Did I not tell you that many a man may be dead and may yet come home? He could not forget that he threw his wife and child into the prison under the lit ropes. But for God's sake, not a word of this. She looked about in the room and shivered. Then she continued in a whisper. I heard queer noises last night, as if something were creeping up the walls and splashing gently in the water, and there was a rustling at your window, and the bats in the alley flew about as it frightened, until long after midnight. I know what it was. He came, after he had done it. He came to greet us, because we had never said good-bye to him. Andrea's head was bowed, as he said that he had slept so soundly that he had heard nothing in the night. He said also that it was best for her to repeat nothing of what she had told him, since it was a dangerous thing to have any knowledge of such a crime, even if committed by a ghost. Then he left the house and went out into a tumult on the street. End of section 5 Recording by Helen